the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to SciFest 2022. Uh, we're very excited. Um, day five, we have had almost 20,000 students participating um, across the programs. Uh, today, we're very excited to have uh, Megan from Australian National Maritime Museum um, presenting our next two programs. Um, and a big thanks to Inspiring Australia, New South Wales, um, for supporting SciFest 2022. So we've been able to do all of these amazing programs for free across the week and of course all of this is part of National Science Week um, which Megan and I were just saying really should be called Science Month because there is so much going on we can't fit it in just a week. So I'm very excited to have Megan here and I'll hand over to her now. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, so before I get too much further, I do want to welcome you to the Australian National Maritime Museum. I'm here in the beautiful Darling Harbour, Sydney, and I want to uh, also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the Bamal and Badu, the land and water that I'm talking to you from today. And I can see there's lots and lots and lots of you joining us today from all across Australia. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge all traditional custodians of the lands and waters that you are joining us from today and um, pay respect to their elders past and present. And once again, welcome to the Australian National Maritime Museum. I hope you've had just as much of an amazing, fun, fantastic science week as we have here. And I've just got quite an informal kind of bit of a chat. We're going to do some experiments. We're going to talk about a little bit of science, a little bit of history, and really just have a bit of a fun explore of the science of the sea and how humans can actually explore and in, have adventures in our oceans. Now, I, as we go through today, I'm going to be asking you some questions and what I would love is whether you are in a classroom or if you're learning from home, I'd love for you to let me know what you think. So if I ask you a question, please pop your answer in the chat function of Zoom. So the chat function of Zoom is where I want your answers. If you're learning from your home, just type it in. If you're in a class, I'll get the teachers to give us a hand by getting all of the answers from their class and popping it in that chat. There's also going to be time, maybe in the middle, but definitely at the end for some Q&A. So if there's anything particular that I say that you're not really sure about or additional questions you may have, you're welcome to pop them in the Q&A at any time and we'll get to them a little bit later on. So when I ask you a question, it goes in the chat. And when you have a question for me, it goes in the Q&A. All right. So let me, I'm just going to pop my slides across a bit and share my screen. So this is the beautiful Darling Harbour. And let's play that video for you. And I want you all talking about popping stuff in the chat, write in the chat what you can see here that is has a really important part of it made of glass. So this National Science Week, the theme for the whole of Australia is glass. And there's something here at our museum that has glass as a really, really important part of how it does its job. Whoop. And there's a bit of a clue there. We'll go back to our video again. So what do you think? So we've got light bulbs, we've got our lighthouse, yes. So glass is such an amazing material and a lot, it's in a lot of our buildings, it's in windows, but yes, it's in 
our beautiful lighthouse. So here at the Australian National Maritime Museum, we actually have three lighthouses. We have our beautiful traditional white lighthouse, the Cape Bowling Green Lighthouse outside. We have a lighthouse boat called the Carpenteria, and we have the Tasman Light in our galleries. Now, lighthouses used to have, like this illustration here, some old-fashioned light bulbs and things like that. So those are, light bulbs are made of glass, very, very important. And as lighthouses got better, they used lenses to focus the light and push the light further. And so this is a great example of scientists using our knowledge of science, in this case of light and lenses, and you can see this lighthouse is bigger than a person, bigger than our conservator there who's giving it a bit of a clean. It's so big, that's what's inside a lighthouse. And using all those lenses to work together to help people out in the sea, out in the oceans, in their ships. So lighthouses are a great example of when scientists use science to help save lives, to help stop ships from sinking. So that is a really important part of glass and boats. But if we're going to have boats out on the ocean, what do they need to do? I think they need to be able to float. So I'll stop sharing that. And I have a question for you guys. I've got some bits and pieces here on my table. I'm going to zoom in on them. I have a funny looking rock. A funny looking rock. Oh, my camera's just focusing. There we go. I have a golf ball. I have a ping pong ball, a cork, some modeling clay, and a balloon. And I want you guys to write in the chat which of these do you think will float and which do you think will sink? So if we're thinking about our boats, our beautiful boats on the harbour, we've got to make sure they float. So I've got lots of different things here and some of them would make good boats and some of them probably wouldn't. So which of these things, we've got our rock, we've got a golf ball, a ping pong ball, some modelling clay and cork and a balloon. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, so we've got lots of stuff coming through there. Beautiful. So I think I can see just about everyone thinks that the balloon's going to float. Because did you guys know that in have, just having this discussion, you guys are starting to do science. You guys are doing what's called creating a hypothesis. And so when scientists do an experiment, it's really important that they have a think before they start about what they expect is going to happen. They use all their prior knowledge. They use all of the things that they've thought about in the past and they've learned about, they've read in books that they've seen when they've been experiencing life. And we think the balloons float. I think just about everyone here has said they think the balloon will float. So let's give it a try. We've, had, we've made a hypothesis and we're going to test it out. And we can see there our balloon is floating on my bowl of water there. Now let's have a look. I think most people, let's have a think about the ping pong ball. Yeah, most people think the ping pong ball will float as well. Another one. And that one also floats. And I think most people also think the cork is going to float. Yeah. And that one floats as well. It's a bit harder to see. Let's zoom in. Yeah, so I've got my balloon, my ping pong ball, and my cork floating there. Now... We've got the golf ball. Now, the golf ball is a bit heavier. It's the same size as our ping pong ball, but it's a bit heavier. It weighs a bit more. So let's have a look. And it's sunk down to the bottom. And then I've got the two trickier ones. We've got our rock. We've got our modeling clay. Just out of the way, so we have a bit more room. 
And let's have a look. Our modeling clay also sinks down to the bottom and our rock is gonna float. So whether you got it right or whether you got it wrong, it doesn't matter. All scientists sometimes get things right and sometimes get things wrong. But you've all created some hypothesis. And together, we've done an experiment that tests these out. And we learn things from it. So, for example, if we look at a rock, it's now very wet. But it's got lots and lots and lots of holes in it. This is a special rock called pumice, and it's actually got lots of air in it. So think of it like lots of tiny little balloons of air caught inside this rock. If I got a different type of rock, it would definitely sink. So I was trying to trick you with that one. So pumice is a special type of rock that floats. It comes from a volcano, but most rock does sink. However, I'm now gonna ask another question. I have this modeling clay and I can bend it and shape it. Do you reckon I, I could make this float? If you think I could make this float, do you want to maybe give me a bit of a hint and tell me how, what could I do to this modeling clay to make it float? So this is actually a really good experiment for you guys to do at home or at school. So what you can do is you can get lots of different materials. You can see what floats, what sinks. So I've got a few people saying make it flat. So I might start making it a bit flat. This is a great engineering challenge as well because some scientists are engineers and engineers have to use their scientific knowledge, their experience, to make things. All right, so we've flattened it out. We haven't changed its weight. It's the exact same amount of clay, but I've made it flat. And now we're gonna experiment. So it stayed on the surface for a moment and then it went down to the bottom. Now, quite a few people are telling me to make it look like a boat. So let's see what happens when we make it like a boat. I've also had some other ideas as well. And these are things you can try at home. Had you can take away parts of the clay, that would make it lighter. So you can try that. I've had some people say, uh, put some holes in it. You can try that one at home too. So I've made, I've pulled the sides up, made it kind of like a bowl or a boat. Let's see. And now it's floating on the surface. So it's floating on the surface of the water here. And so what is happening is there's now lots of air in it. And that air is adding to the volume of my modeling clay. And by adding to the volume of my modeling clay, it's actually making it float. So when something's floating, it helps if it's light, but we can use heavy materials to make things that float too by increasing their volume, making them bigger so that they push away more water because you want the volume of your floating thing to be more the volume, the amount of um, space it takes up to be more than the volume of water that needs to be lighter. So the, this needs to be lighter, including all this air in it, then the volume of water that it's pushing out of the way to float. And so this is a scientific concept called displacement. And it's really a fun one 
that you can play with at home. Try it playing around with different different materials, different plastic cup, plastic cup or a glass cup or different things and seeing what floats and what sinks. And I've had a bit of a play with a ping pong ball and turned it into a submarine because for a ping pong ball, it floats. It's the exact same ping pong ball, exact same time. But we want a submarine to first float, but then we want it to sink, and then we want it to float again. So for a submarine, like we've got a submarine outside here at the Maritime Museum, we're not going to change its shape this time. What might I do to make my submarine float and then sink and then float again? What could I change? my little submarine with this little periscope. All right. <laughs> so I've got my little submarine. Because the ping pong ball floats, I've actually added some weight, added some plasticine to make it a little bit heavier, but it's still going to float up near the surface. So my submarine is still floating there. Take the pimple ball out. If I can make my submarine heavier, I'm going to add some water to it, make it a bit heavier. That's all. So I've added extra water onto the inside of it. Now it sinks. So now my submarine's sinking because I've added extra water to it. And if I take out some of the water, it's going to float again. And if I take out even more, Float even a bit higher. So that is actually how submarines work. So our submarine out here at the Maritime Museum and most submarines will be like our ping pong ball. There's a big empty space in here. And when it's floating, that space is filled with air, making it a little bit lighter. When the submarine wants to sink, it fills up with water, making it heavier, and it'll sink. And then when they want to float back up to the surface, a sub the submarine will use compressed air to push the water out, and that makes our submarine lighter again and comes back up to the surface. So science and this, these sorts of scientific concepts are really, really interesting for us to learn about, but they're also really important for the engineers and the inventors and for the people who create all these amazing inventions just like a submarine. So that is how submarine floats and sinks. So... We're talking about a submarine sinking. What do you think a person would need if they were going under the water? Do you think a person can dive under the water like a submarine? Mm -hmm. So a human can't change our weight. We can't make ourselves heavier or lighter. If we want to, for example, float on the water, we do like what we did with the clay. We can put our arms out. We can make ourselves nice and flat and float on the surface of the water. But we can, and divers in the past would have been able to dive down in the water. And I've got someone here talking about scuba equipment. 
Yes. So I'm actually going to show you a picture now of some old fashioned scuba equipment. And it's kind of like what I've got here next to me as well. So divers in the past, because our bodies are, we float, don't we? We fairly float. And if you have a big suit like this one next to me and you have lots of air being pumped down to you because we need air to breathe, divers would become kind of like a balloon and our balloon floated. So you can imagine our diver in a suit like the one in the picture or the one next to me and you've got lots of air being pumped down to them to be able to swim down to the bottom of the ocean. Now that air being pumped down to them so that they can breathe becomes like a balloon and they want to float up. And so just like the heavy things sunk in our experiment, divers had to have really heavy things to help them sink. And this really heavy shoe, which is very hard for me to pick up, even with both hands, helped our diver sink down to the bottom of the ocean to be able to dive. Now, scuba divers today still use additional weights. So scuba divers today, if you ever go diving in the future when you get a bit older, you can go scuba diving and you will have to have some weights to be able to help you sink down. And you can also adjust the amount of air in um, that you've got using your compressed air tank in a bit of a kind of, kind of like a submarine in a way to actually make you more or less buoyant. So divers do the exact same thing our submarines do. They have to get, make themselves heavier to help dive down so they're not floating. And nowadays with scuba gear, you can adjust that as you dive. So really, 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 really fascinating physics behind all of this traveling, this making boats, submarines, and scuba divers. All right, I'm just going to have a look there. If there's anything we've talked about so far, please make sure you pop stuff in the Q&A for questions to answer later. But everyone's been putting lots and lots of amazing comments in the chat. Now, just seeing how we've got plenty of time, so I'm going to do another experiment. All right, so stop sharing that. Here I've got a bottle of water. It is just normal tap water. And I am going to make something called a Cartesian diver. And so you might have seen this experiment before, and it links to our scuba divers and our Diver, our old fashioned diver here, and it also links to submarines. So, what I've done, and this is another one you can do at school or at home, is I've got a straw, a bendy straw. Let's zoom in. So, I got a bendy straw and I cut, cut it so it's a bit shorter. Let's see if I can hold that up so you can see. And then I've got a piece of our modeling clay and blocked up the short end. I've blocked up the short end here, and then I've got this end a bit longer and this end is open. So you can also do this with like a pen cap if it doesn't have a hole, any holes in it, or you can do it with other bits and pieces um, to actually make a little diver. And I'm just gonna put it in this bottle of water, which is pretty much filled up just about to the top. And if I put my diver in here, can see there's just a little bit of space at the top there but the um our little bit of modeling clay a little bit of plasticine there has caused it to go down now what i've actually done is i've actually trapped air inside the diver here so inside the straw there is air trapped in there and if i put my lid back on what do you think is going to happen when I squeeze on the bottle now. Pop in the chat 
You might have seen this experiment before. If not, just have a guess. So do you think anything will happen when I squeeze this bottle? So there's air trapped inside the straw. And so we've blocked up the straw, the short end of the straw, so the air can't escape. <laughs> yeah, some of people have seen it before. So if you've seen it before, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> All right. So if I squeeze it, I think most people seem to have seem to be getting on the right idea. If I squeeze it, see that sink down? And if I let it go, it goes back up. Squeeze the bottle, it goes down. And if I squeeze it, it goes back up. Now the reason I liked doing this with a straw is it means I can actually see inside. And what I can see, let's see if I zoom in, see how far this camera will zoom in. Okay. And focus. Okay. So my straw here is filled with air. And you can just see on the bottom there, that's where the air and the water meets. As I squeeze, can you guys see? That line moving up. So just at the bottom of the straw there, there's a little line. We've got our air at the top and our water at the bottom. And as I squeeze, that moves. So what is happening is water, when we squeeze it, it doesn't really switch. It doesn't compress. Whereas air, we can compress. That's how they actually make scuba tanks. They compress air and they make it a lot smaller. So if you push, 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 push in and put air under a lot of pressure, it squeezes down and becomes smaller. And so why my diver sinks is that as I squeeze, the pressure in the water, in, the pressure increases, and that pushes the air smaller, meaning more water goes into the bottom of the straw, and that makes my diver heavier because it has the water coming into it, just like our submarine. When we put the water in the submarine, it went it sunk. And so water pressure is actually a really interesting thing for us to think about. Because as I squeeze this, the air compressed. And that would happen with humans too. So humans can dive underwater. They can old-fashioned diving in our diving suit here. They can scuba dive. So scuba is self-contained breathing apparatus, I think. So our scuba is... You can dive down to a certain depth, but just like our little diver here, eventually the pressure becomes too much and the air inside that we need to breathe and our bodies as well, all the rest of the material in our body would compress and get squished. That also happens to submarines. If submarines go too deep, deeper than they're built for, they can squish and they can get compressed because water is heavy. Water is heavy. And if you've ever held too many big, heavy drink bottles of drink, if you've gone shopping for a party or something like that, you know liquids and water and stuff can get really, really heavy. And so when we think about the deep ocean, the deep, 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 deep ocean, we need to think about all the pressure and we need to protect the air that we need to breathe. So if you're going to build a submarine, 
to actually go down to the deepest part of the ocean, you have to think about all these different scientific concepts. You have to be able to make it sink. You then have to make it float again. You have to be able to withstand the water pressure. And I think you have to be pretty good at science. And there is a scientist or an adventurer that we talked about here at the museum a couple of years ago. We had an exhibition. And I'll share a photo of this submarine. So this is a submarine called Deep Sea Challenger. And it's a submarine specifically made to go to the deep, 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 deep ocean. So to get it to go down, they made it heavier. So they have weights on our submarine that allowed it to descend down, 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 down to the bottom of the ocean. Once it was finished, those weights dropped off. They had a trigger to be able to drop them off. It was then lighter and it came back up. It was very, 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 very strongly built so that it could withstand the water pressure that would squeeze the air inside it. So it actually, they made a sphere, a special protected sphere, so that the person inside, um, a man named James Cameron, who also makes lots of movies, so they needed to protect him. So they made a very strong sphere to withstand that water pressure. And in fact, this submarine actually got shorter at the bottom of the ocean. So all of that pressure, now, all that pressure pushing in made it shorter at the bottom of the ocean. Now, I'm going to show you something very special from our museum collection about showing exactly what happens. Look at a polystyrene cup. It's nowhere near as strong as this submarine. Just have a chat with the person next to you. What do you think would happen if I took this cup down to the bottom of the ocean? What do you think would happen? All right. So this one's quite an interesting one. Yeah, so we've got some people saying it will float up again. So, yeah, you're right. If it wasn't attached to anything, it would float because a polystyrene cup will float. Got someone saying it will turn to mush. Some materials do turn to mush. If it was a paper cup, it would turn to mush. Polystyrene is a type of plastic, um, and so it would take a very long time for it to break apart, and it actually won't break down or break into nothing. What happens, so a few people have said this, and you guys are really good, it will crush, it will get squished. So a cup like this actually went down to the bottom of the ocean and turned teeny tiny. So it got crushed and the water pressure turned it very, very, very small. So our submarine, the Deep Sea Challenger, it actually got a little bit shorter. It crushed a little bit, but not much. They made it out of really, really strong material. And they actually made it from a different type of foam that contained little bits of glass, little glass spheres that were really strong. So if you've been doing lots of other science week stuff you might have learned a lot more about glass and glass is such a really amazing strong material and really really important to allow this particular submarine and others like it to go down to the deepest parts of the ocean and actually allow scientists to explore what is down there and before we get into the questions I will show you what scientists discover. Now, don't worry, this video doesn't have any sound, so you're all good. This is some of the creatures that scientists find when they go down to the deepest parts of the ocean. 
And so have a think about what these scientists would think when they saw these creatures for the first time. So scientists, the reason scientists love going down and exploring the deeper parts of the ocean, places we can't scuba dive to, but we can take submarines or in this case, remote control vehicles, or remote operated vehicles, ROVs, down into the bottom of the ocean, is that we can find things that you would not believe. We can find the most crazy, amazing creatures. And the last Last one I'll leave up here while we get into questions is the glass octopus. So even though well, we make glass so that we can see through it, this octopus has actually developed so that its body is like glass, it's clear. And so it's actually a really great way to hide from predators, to hide from things trying to eat it. And we can only see little bits of its in insides where it's its skin and a lot of its body is transparent, is clear. But it's been absolutely amazing to chat with you today. I did see that we have had a few questions coming through and I might get Karen back to help me have a think about some of these questions and all this different, different science that we've talked about this afternoon. Oh, you just on mute, Karen. I clicked my button too quickly. If you just want to stop sharing your screen for a sec, I've actually got a shell from a ram's horn squid. So I'll just oh, wow. myself. It's quite small. I'll try to hold it mm. up my face. So you actually find these often washed up on the beach if you keep an eye out in the high tide mark. So that's actually the, the part inside the squid that helps it float and go up and down. So it can be quite interesting. So, um, yeah, let's go through some of these questions. Um, so why can't people breathe underwater? That is a really good question. And I think it's, if we think about all of, all of the animals on the planet, think about all the animals on the planet, we have different categories of animals, don't we? And I'm sure, I'm sure there's lots of people with different, from different year groups here today, but you've all probably learned that we've got things like fish, and fish can breathe underwater. They have gills and they've developed their biology, has specially designed them to live in the water and to get their oxygen. Oxygen is what um, animals need to live and to get their oxygen out of the water. But humans, humans are not fish, humans are mammals. And lots of our different types of animals, like mammals and uh, birds and reptiles all of these animals have evolved over so many years to actually get our oxygen from the air because air is not just oxygen we also breathe in nitrogen and carbon dioxide so we're breathing in all of these different gases but over thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years we've actually um, evolved to get it from the air because we live 
in the air, not in the water. Mm. And so it's really important, I think, if, if humans want to go into other environments, whether it's down into the deep ocean or up into space, we need to think about how we can take that air with us and how we can allow our bodies to keep getting that oxygen that it needs. Mm, absolutely. And we've got, um, uh, Viminka just mentioned that amphibians can, can do both. So it's really interesting with amphibians. As tadpoles, the first part of their life, they breathe through gills underwater. But once they're adults, they've actually developed lungs. So they need to breathe. But frogs also have a really awesome skin that actually allows them to breathe and absorb water um, and mm -hmm. other things through their skin. So quite amazing. Um, can the deep sea challenger go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench? Yes. So the deep sea challenger, which is the submarine I showed you a picture of, was specifically designed to do exactly that. So uh, quite a few, few years ago now, uh, James Cameron, he was the first person to do it by himself and the second, I guess, um, vehicle to get down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. So there'd been one before called the Trieste, which had had two people in, inside. Um, and it had actually, interestingly enough, its window had cracked while it was down there from the huge pressure. So even though they'd made it to try and be as strong as they could, its window had actually cracked. It had almost sunk, almost failed and sunk. Oh. So when they made, built the Deep Sea Challenger, and it was some Australian scientists and inventors that helped develop a foam that has all these little glass beads and these little glass spheres in it to help withstand that huge pressure that's trying to squish it. So that huge pressure that can squish a cup like this down to this size. And so to be able to make the submarine, it did shrink a little bit. It did get squished in a little bit. They made it so that it would be able to stay solid down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Excellent. And interestingly, there's, now there's actually been a bit of a, a rush of, of more explorers going down there. And I think there's now over 20 um, different people have been down there. There's been, there's, there's been quite a few different expeditions in the last few years down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And scientists are finding all sorts of new plants and animals but they're also finding human-made things like rubbish and plastic. So it's really amazing, but it's also a little bit sad what we're finding down in the deepest parts of our ocean. Uh, we just had another um, question pop up in the chat about how far the deepest person has gone. So what I'm going to do, if that's okay, Megan, in um, our follow-up with the recording, um, I've actually got a really good interactive um, deep sea dive. That's essentially, you scroll down and you can see how far the deepest person's gone like scuba diving um, and then a lot of these animals remembering things like the birds and reptiles do breathe through lungs so they've got to go down and come back up to get air whereas things like um, the uh, sharks and other fish and um, marine invertebrates actually can stay down there uh, a long time so that's a really great thing to explore later on um, how did they get that submarine into the water so how did it get from being at you know when it was built to the water to be able to get down to the Marianas Trench. Yeah, so when we uh, build submarines like that, whether it's a submarine for a person to go in or also our things like our remote operated vehicles, things like that, they're actually on larger research, research ships. So think kind of like a really big, kind of like a container ship, but a bit smaller, so a very industrial looking boat. And they go out into the ocean and boats are a great one to think about as well because they're made of metal or fiberglass or materials like that. And we use our science to make them float. But they're on these big boats. They'll have a crane that will lift the submarine up. And so the crane will lift the submarine up and put it in the water. And um, that is actually really important because, of course, it's got those weights on it. So it wants to sink. So... Once they're all ready, you've got the crane there, it's holding it up at the surface. And then when everything's ready, everything's good to go. They've done lots and lots of tests. They, um, the crane lets it go. And then because it's got those weights on it, it's heavy and it slowly descends down 
and down and down. Now they'd make sure it doesn't go down too fast because they want to have a nice gradual pressure change both down and on the way back up. So you're spending a long time in your journey to and from the bottom of the ocean. Um, and yes, then they can uh, take the weights off. They can release them. They drop to the bottom of the ocean and the submarine, which is now lighter, can float. And having all that foam in it, that foam and glass is light enough to come back up to the surface. And once again, that crane picks it up and puts it back on the boat. Oh, it's amazing. It's so many different branches of science and engineering going in there, isn't it? Um, we've got a question about the faceless, um, uh, was it tusk eel or tusk eel? Um, yeah. How can it see if it doesn't have eyes? So that's a really good one because a lot, well down here, and it really leads to a question about why is the glass octopus see-through? Hmm. It's too dark. So yeah. there's, no, there's no light. So you don't really need eyes and it doesn't matter if you see through. Um, so a lot of them are using their other senses to pick up um, what other animals and things are around them. So they don't need to see because there's nothing to see um, because it is completely pitch dark. Yes, and I've just had a quick look in my notes as well. So um, everything in that video and the glass octopus as well was found by a group of scientists on from the Schmidt Ocean Institute and um, using their ROV Sebastian, their little robot. And um, I actually read in my notes here, so the faceless cusk eel actually they've actually found it does have eyes, but they're so small and they're kind of basically covered with skin that they don't do anything. So over time, that particular eel has evolved to not really use its eyes because as Karen said, it's dark. It's not, it's not seeing anything anyway. And so if, I'm sure if you go back through the evolution, it actually would link up to eels that uh, did use their eyes and lived in a different environment. <laughs> Um, Samantha's really interested about how you made the hole in the ping pong to make the submarine. So this is a good one for those of you that are going to do that experiment at home, which is going to be lots of fun. All you need is modelling clay and a ping pong ball. And so how do you put the hole in? Um, so how you get the hole in is work with an adult. And how I did it is I just got something very sharp, like a skewer, and um, pressed it in and kind of just had kind of made it bigger and bigger and bigger very slowly until I could fit my um, pipette, my little syringe in. And that is how I can take water out and how I can put water back in to change how heavy it is and kind of simulate those, these air, what they're actually called ballast tanks in a submarine. And interestingly, ships also have ballast um, tanks as well because if your ship is really high up on the water and you, you can try this as well with a plastic cup if you try and put a plastic empty plastic cup on the water it falls over so that's another one for if you want to try it at home so I just used like a sharp um, skewer to actually poke my hole in the ping pong ball to make my submarine but you can also try making a boat getting plastic cups or different different types of materials you can have at home and actually see if you can get your plastic cup to float because it'll be really hard if it's empty and you'll actually need to add some weight. You will actually need to add some, whether it's plasticine or water or something like that to make it heavy. So ballast tanks are in boats and submarines and all of these things to actually allow them to kind of sit in the water and be nice and stable and not fall over. Excellent. So we've got a few more questions about animals breathing underwater and not. So someone's talking about turtles breathing underwater. Actually, turtles need to come to the surface to be able to breathe. So when you see them underwater swimming, um, they can stay underwater for quite a long time, but they're a reptile. They breathe through lungs. They need to come to the surface. So we've got someone else mentioning the crocodile and the platypus. The same thing. Crocodiles are reptiles. They need to come to the surface to breathe. Platypus are mammals again coming to the surface so sometimes it's really tricky when we've got marine um, reptiles or marine mammals um, to think about or even the freshwater mammal like a platypus to think about how they're actually breathing but no they they need to come to the surface yeah and different animals will also be able to hold their breaths for different lengths of time as well so particularly if you are a marine animal 
you've probably been a lot more successful in your environment if you can hold your breath for longer. So over years and years and years, evolution has meant that those animals that are going to survive and going to be able to pass their genetics onto the next generation are going to be the ones that can hold their breath for longer. So that's why things like, for example, whales, whales need to breathe, but they can hold their breath for an incredibly long amount of time. So um, I'm happy to keep doing some more questions. We do know that there are people that have to have to um, go. It might be the end of your school day. So um, definitely if you, if you do need to go, that's totally fine. And I've loved chatting with you. Yeah. Otherwise, we can keep going and keep doing a few more questions as well. Excellent. So thank you for those of you that have joined us but need to head off or the bell's gone and we'll get through a few more of these questions for those of you that can stay. But as I said, we will share a copy of the recording and I'll share that really fun link um, so you can explore the deep sea. And I know Megan has got some links from the Maritime Museum for us to share as well. So you'll get those later on this afternoon. <laughs> so we've All got right. Another question about how deep can a submarine go until it gets crushed? Is that all about the design? about where what their journey is what their um yeah scientific research mission mm -hmm. yeah so this is a really interesting one for anyone who likes to think about engineering and engineering is a science engineers need to know all about the science and some of the science things we've talked about today but it's all about thinking about what the submarine is going to be used for so for example if you're deliberately building a submarine that's going to go to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, it doesn't need to move very fast. It doesn't need to have lots of hundreds of people on it. So you're going to deliberately make design choices and engineering choices that are going to allow it to go down to that bottom of the ocean. And if anyone's like the bottom of the ocean is further down than the top of Mount Everest, like it's so, so far down. So if you're going to make a submarine that does that, you're going to specifically design it to be able to do that. If, for example, you're designing a submarine like for the Navy and anyone who's visited us at the Maritime Museum might have been on the H. Mayer's Onslow, which is a Navy submarine, that submarine can't go down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. It's not designed for it. Um, so it would have limits. And unfortunately, if a submarine goes deeper than those limits, it can actually have failures, have accidents. And actually Australia's first submarine accidentally went too deep and, and that's what happened to it. And scientists currently think that it had technical malfunctions and it actually is now at the bottom of the ocean. So it's really important for engineers to think about where the submarine has to go. And that's what will determine about how deep it can go. Excellent. Um, so we've got a few more. So what's below the bottom of the ocean? What's below the bottom of the ocean? That is a great question. Well, of course, below the bottom of the ocean is the Earth's crust. And so we have that below the bottom of the ocean. We also have it on land as well. So we have the Earth's crust and the Earth's crust is, of course, solid. And then we have the different layers of the Earth. So the magma and the solid core as well. And there's heaps of cool, once again, so much cool science to do with the geology of our Earth. And sometimes that, that inside the Earth can actually break through. That's why we have things called like volcanoes. And in the ocean, we also have vents and where that, that, that heat and that pressure from the inside of the earth can escape. And also we can even have underwater volcanoes. And many of the islands in places like the Pacific are actually underwater volcanoes that when that below the surface of the ocean breaks out of the crust and starts building up, um, yeah, volcanoes that can eventually become islands if they reach the surface. Excellent. I'm just typing some questions. <laughs> in there as well right um well there's there's one question i saw in the chat earlier when we were doing experiment and it was relating to our diver here and it was what would happen if the diver got water in it and that's a great question so i was very careful when i put my diver in to make sure i get that air pocket if i put it in upside down and it filled with water it would sink and if i shook the bottle up around a lot and got water in it it would sink so our diver only works 
because it's got that air trapped in the straw. If, for example, there was a hole in it, once again, it would fill up with water and it would sink. So um, that is what would happen. But definitely this is another one. And you can find lots of instructions on the internet or I can um, sort of send some instructions as well around about how you can do these experiments at home or at school to kind of continue your science week fun um, into next week as well. So our, our final question seems to be a lot around sort of, you know, the smallest fish, the rarest fish, um, <laughs> the smallest submarine. There is one of the longest of fish has ever been able to hold its breath. Well, the fish use gills, so they don't need to hold their breath. They're already in water. <laughs> but if a fish was out of water, it depends on the type of fish, how long it can survive out of water before it needs to go big, back in. So I guess that's holding its breath. It's a little bit the reverse. Um, what <laughs> fish live in Antarctica? These are all things that I think would be great research questions for you guys to follow up on. And the last question we've got is the deepest ocean in the world, which really links to the Marianas Trench, doesn't it? Yeah. So if we think about um, our oceans, well, interestingly, scientists currently think it's the Mariana Trench. But we actually don't know a whole lot about our oceans. And a lot of uh, scientists and people on these research vessels are actually working to map all of our oceans. And so they're still trying to work out exactly how deep everything is. Um, but the Mariana Trench is, from what we currently know, the deepest point in our ocean. And this is actually because the world isn't made up of a, a flat kind of surface it's made up of plates that are like puzzle pieces and they move around and sometimes they push up together and create um, kind of ridges and then they also push together and go down into trenches and these move and they change over long 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 periods of time so the mariana trench is from what we currently believe is the deepest point in our ocean um, and it's a great one for you to, there's so much stuff on the internet about it. So once again, I hope you guys have all, all your questions and actually think about these and continue researching them. Have a look also at your local library um, is a great place to go to find out all about these things and have a look at, make sure you're looking at uh, kind of good sources on the internet as well. So things like museum websites, zoo websites, all these places, um, scientific um, kind of resources that we can go to, to look for answer all these amazing questions. And hopefully you can learn out, learn about even more of the science of our oceans. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really fascinating. We had so many questions that we've gone a little bit over time, but it was absolutely worth it. We'll share some links about the deep sea and some links to the Australian National Maritime Museum. And remember, Science Week is all about getting inspired and excited. This is the beginning of your journey, um, the beginning and all of these questions and ideas give you things to research and follow up about. So we will help you do that as well. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>